kids around the screen.
they don't have a clock. Yeah. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> And you'll have to be my clock. When I go. Doug will beat you to it. Everyone take a songbook and uh, turn to number 784. We'll sing some of the older traditional songs tonight. 784, Why Did My Savior Come to Earth? <clears throat> After this song, we'll ask Charlie to lead us in prayer. Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a lowly bird? Because he Father, it is in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we approach your throne of grace and mercy with thanksgiving. Thank you, loving Father, for a good day that you have given us to live. Thank you, Father, for the many blessings that we receive from your bountiful hands. For it is written that every good and perfect gift comes from your bountiful hands. Thank you, loving Father, for the common salvation that we share here at Main Street. We pray, Father, that you will look upon our worship and our Bible study this evening with, with great favor. We 
Pray, Heavenly Father, that we may worship in spirit and in truth and thus be pleasing in your sight. Our Father, we ask your blessings upon our coming together for the Bible study as uh, our brother leads our study from the Gospel of John. We pray, Father, for a good understanding, a rightful understanding as we delve deep into those things as we study and learn. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll open our hearts of understanding, that we may learn more and more and we may be edified from the truth that we learn here in our Bible studies. Our Father, we pray for the church that meets here. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will continue to bless the elders, the deacons, the evangelists, the, the Bible class teachers, and everyone who takes a part here and does their part uh, to build up the church that meets here in, in Mount Sterling. Our Father, we thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy that you have extended to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Father, we ask you to be mindful and, and forgive us our sins, our trespasses. Father, we confess unto you that uh, we oft times say things and do things that our conscience then will condemn us. And when we, when we do, Father, we, we need to turn from those things, confess those things unto you. And Father, we know that you're faithful and just to forgive us. Our Father, be with Brother Salmon, be with everyone that's assembled here uh, this evening for the purpose of worship and Bible study. Father, we pray for the church here that meets here, that we may continue to grow in grace and knowledge, and that, Father, that we'll be like that city that was set on the hill that could not be hid, that people may see our good works and glorify you, uh, which is in heaven. Thank you, loving Father, for your love, your grace, and your mercy. For it is in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Two hundred. <clears throat> Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels praise, proclaim, all ye thoughts together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high, praise him, O ye heavens, and the 
in 694. I'm going to invite you to stand if you'd like, and we're going to sing the odd number verses, 1, 3, and 5, to Canaan's land. Canaan's land, I'm on my way where the soul of man never dies. My darkest night will turn to day where the soul of man never dies. No stress. Good evening. Time for us to begin our Bible study, and hopefully we'll finish John chapter 4 tonight, but we will see. All right, so can anyone tell me, I don't know why a whole bunch of emojis just popped up on my thing here. Okay, there we go. Uh, Can anyone tell me what's happened in John chapter 4? Jesus is traveling through Samaria. Yep. He's thirsty. Yes. Right. Then they have a fun discussion about her uh, history and her life. Yep. And about uh, future worship. Yes, very good. That was a great summary. A plus, A plus, very good. Um, All right, so what I wanted to really emphasize and just to remind ourselves, because I kind of get lost in the text as well sometimes, but there's more going on than just the immediate conversations. Just like with Nicodemus, just like with the Samaritan woman, there's the immediate context. But remember, John's writing not a chronological gospel, right? He's not walking you through, Jesus did this, and then this, and then this. John is very intentionally orchestrating these different conversations, and he's kind of um, 
I guess the word is juxtaposing. He's putting two things together to get you to examine that kind of have a common thread between them. And along with chapter one, remember, there's a whole bunch of themes that are spread uh, throughout the gospel that are all connecting to that central idea, going back to the word of God, because Jesus is the word, because the word indicates the heart or the intentions or the thoughts. And Jesus is the physical manifestation of God's heart, of his mind, of his will. And Jesus embodies that in the flesh. And so that's going to um, be spectacular in the sense that there's a lot of miracles and there's a lot of signs, as you would expect, with God in flesh, but there's also a lot of confusion. That's what we're going to see in John, is there's constantly confusion about Jesus, about his identity, about what he teaches, and not really on the fault of Jesus, right? I mean, it's on the fault of the hearer, because either they don't have all the knowledge or because of their own disbelief. They don't accept the things that Jesus uh, says and that he teaches. But We see that kind of contrasted with the woman at the well, uh, because remember, she's at first inquisitive, right? And then she says, I perceive you're a prophet, but she doesn't understand the true meaning of this living water because she's like, oh, great. I don't have to do chores anymore. I don't have to walk all the way outside the city and carry those big pails of water. It's done. And then she's realizing quickly that Jesus is much more, is talking about much more than just a physical water that, that quenches your thirst. It's so much more important. Um, and so remember, she, she runs away. She's amazed, not runs away, but she runs back to her town and she says, come see the man that told me everything I ever did. She was amazed by this. But then the disciples come back and they're astonished at what Jesus is doing. Why are they shocked? Yes. Oh yeah, completely not accepted at all. And so what Jesus was doing was quite scandalous. To a Jewish leader, they're like, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman? That's not a good look. This is not a good look for Jesus. Um, At least in these very carnal minds that weren't seeing the full picture of what God was doing. But what do the disciples come back with? They they bring something to Jesus. Food. Yeah, they bring him food. Yeah, (laughs) that's exactly right. But it's kind of funny. I don't know if there's any intent behind this besides it's just kind of funny. Jesus was thirsty and his disciples brought him food. (laughs) I just thought that was kind of funny. Uh, But the disciples bring Jesus food. And then how does Jesus respond to this? I have food. Yeah. And what do the disciples say? Yeah, (laughs) they want to bring him something. I don't remember. I, I, I didn't. Did you? No, no. But what does Jesus say? What is Jesus' food? Verse 34. Yes, my food is to do the will of him who sent me to accomplish his work. All right, now, that's a key phrase, that work. Keep that in mind, that the work of God, he's accomplishing the work of God or the will of God. So what's his food? To do the work of God or to do the will of God. That's his food. That's what sustains him. Now, this connects back. And hang with me here to Nicodemus. At the end, Jesus makes an Old Testament comparison to him. He, the Nehushtan. Does anyone, anyone remember what that is? The Nehushtan? You know. The, it has something to do with a rod. And, uh, yeah, a serpent. Yeah, very good. It's the, yeah, yeah, that insignia. Um, Jesus compares himself to the Nehushtan from Numbers 21. So if you remember, that was when God sent these fiery serpents that bit the people, and some of them died, some of them were sick. And then Moses, by the, will, by the word of God, God instructed him, he built this pole where he made a bronze fiery serpent. And he put it on the pole, and anyone who was sick or bitten by the fiery serpent, what did they have to do? They had to go and look on it. So it was set up, right? They're looking on this thing, uh, this really uh, a symbol of death. And so when you kind of ponder that and you think about this, when you think about the context of that, does anyone remember why God sent the fiery serpents to begin with in Numbers 21? They were murmuring. They were murmuring. Yeah, and specifically, they list two things, which is food and drink. Isn't that interesting? The, the, the Jews, when they exited, they were like, we don't have the food we want. We don't have you know, enough water. We're thirsty. And so they complain about those things. But what's going on here is Jesus is emphasizing a spiritual thirst and a spiritual hunger. And so they kind of go together in this very thematic way that's not you know, immediately apparent, but it's, it's cool to digest. But why look at the serpent? So when you think about this conversation with this woman, Jesus opened up a uncomfortable topic for her, right? Which was her current sinful situation. And that's not very comfortable. 
But why Jesus needs to address it is because, like I said on Sunday, a doctor can't heal what you don't present them with, right? If you don't, if you don't tell them what the problem is or what your symptoms are, they can't heal it. They can't give you any medicine. And so Jesus, the whole idea of Jesus being the Lamb of God that John the Baptist testifies about back in chapter 1 is that he bears the sin, right? And so when you think about the fiery serpent, what they're looking on was that symbol of death that brought them to that point, but at the same time it healed them. The symbol of death healed them. And so when you look at the cross, you see Jesus bearing the burden of our sin to purify us. He's the Lamb of God. He takes that on himself. And I by no means mean Jesus is sinful. I mean, he's bearing the consequence and the sacrifice that was pleasing to God. Uh, any questions so far before we kind of finish out this chapter? Are you going to look at John 6, 27, that you're not getting from that? And uh, I don't know if we're getting ahead of ourselves, but 20 verse 27 and then down to verse 29, it talks about the meat. Yeah. Do you want to read it? Do you want to read it? No, go ahead. <laughs> I don't Okay, uh, 27 through 29, you said? Yeah. Okay. Uh, do, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, we must, uh, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. That goes along perfectly with it. So faith is a work. Yes. Yeah, yeah, essentially, uh, and, and a work of uh, a work of God, which is going to connect to the next chapter with the Sabbath. I like it. Good point. I often wonder why, you know, God forgave those Israelites through that murmur. Why didn't He just take the snakes away? And it goes back to what He just said. I think mm -hmm. you have to have faith. You have to have a work. You have to go to that call. Look at that plant. You see what yes. I'm yeah. No. Absolutely. It took yeah. Even though, you know, there was consequences to pay for your sin and murmuring. Right. But there was forgiveness and mm -hmm. you didn't have to die. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and I I'm so sorry. I didn't no, know. That's, that's what I was thinking. Right. I think that's a good observation. I think it's an accurate one because, I mean, as we're going to see in chapter 5, you have to, uh, I'm sorry, chap yeah, chapter 5, you have to want to be healed. And the faith, you know, faith entails obedience because if I say, you know, if you, don't, if you don't say thank you, I'm going to slap you on the back of the head. If you believe me, you're going to say thank you because you don't want to get slapped in the back of the head. You know, if you truly believe something, it, it, you fulfill it with obedience. Yes, sir. Most denominational churches today teach their disciples or their learners that well, you're not saved by works. And right. They've had people convinced that, that, then, that baptism is a work, and therefore you, it's not necessary to be saved. Right. But even... Yeah. Uh, baptism is a work of God's righteousness, not a work. Man didn't yes. baptism. Yes, exactly. Baptism is a work of God's righteousness. Right. And, and so when you, when you read that scripture there to them about faith being a work, it, it, they just sort of shun that. They don't, they don't tackle it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, ex I've seen that before, and it's kind of, it's just such a misunderstanding because, you know, you can't conflate God's work with human works because that's, baptism isn't human righteousness. You know, it's, a, it's not humans' ideas. It's God's. And obedience to God's will is never, you know, a man-made work or like a self-made righteousness. It's all dependent upon God and his grace. And that whole chapter um, in Hebrews 11 talks about, you know, faith. It says it's impossible to be pleased in the God of faith. Yes. All those things that those people did were done through faith. Right. Hence, in the future. Mm -hmm. But that was Abraham's, it's accounted to him for righteousness. Right. Because of faith he had, even though he sacrificed his son, he knew he would raise him from the dead. Yeah. Because that's who the promise was coming to. I mean, you know, that's, I think, the obstacle for most people through the ages is they just cannot believe what is taught. Right. Because it's God's mind revealed to us. Yeah. And that's the, I mean, belief is the crucial part that we see in John is whether they believed or not. But it, it's not this type of faith that it's like, I'll just take my word for it kind of a thing. Like, yeah, it's, it's not a blind faith. And that's what, what is so, what Jesus condemned so much in his own people was because they saw the signs right before their, their eyes. They had the evidence. They had the scriptural knowledge. 
and the wherewithal to realize that prophecy was being fulfilled, but it doesn't matter. And so to, at the point in time that you just decide, I'm not accepting the things of God, it doesn't matter what amount of evidence you bring. It doesn't matter what kind of reason, logic, scripture, it, do, it doesn't matter because there's those who have just tuned their hearts off uh, to God. I think Romans 1 kind of talks about that as well, that, you know, deny worshiping the creation rather than creator. And it's a, there's enough evidence to know. Oh, yes, sir. Don't you think, and, and this could go far, but stop it. Um, don't you think that a lot of times when, as, as mankind, that we try to rely on God's thoughts with our thoughts, we try to make logic of those things. Like, I'll agree, I'll have faith if, if I think it makes sense. Right. You know what I mean? I yeah. Mean, and so when something doesn't make sense to us, we think it's wrong. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's just like I was thinking about that you're talking about that passage, I was thinking about Thomas when Jesus told him, you know, you, you believe that you see, but blessed are those who don't see and believe. Right. And it's one of those things I think that we have to have our faith in God that he is who he is and what he, he, he does what he says he does. Yep. I don't have to have his thoughts align with mine to agree with Stan. Right. Okay, then, then I believe. Yeah. That's not the way it works. Yeah. That's too many times I think that's the way I, I believe that. Right. It's, it's hard not to do that because, I mean, really, you, you filter everything through how you think and how you reason, right? Um, I could get, I, I kind of, I'll just say this very quickly. So there's almost a dichotomy, like, between that because with Abraham, right, he, as you mentioned, he had faith in God even when it didn't make sense. I mean, and I think you can kind of see that. It's not like Abraham was just like, oh, yay, I'm going to go sacrifice my son that I've been waiting for these years. You know, I don't think he had a skip and a step and a whistle and a tune while he did it, you know. There's probably a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, but he rationed it away through the process of belief in his experience with God. He's like, I don't understand it, but I know God's going to work it out. But there's a difference between that, and I think some people go too far with that, where they think, well, God is so much higher than we are that it doesn't even matter to reason through things or use logic because C.S. Lewis wrote about that idea and he said that if anyone, you know, to call God good, if he's so different from us, if his good may be evil and his evil may be good, then what basis do we have for calling God good? And so the idea is that we're somewhat aligned, like we're made in the image of God. I think we have some semblance of that, but it's not a perfect understanding. And sometimes they are contradictory, but it won't be like, outright evil to us that did, did that make any sense whatsoever yeah. All right. very good um so let's look back at chapter four because i, I want to well we'll look at that in a second we'll go ahead and finish out the chapter um let's see here verse 36 it says uh, i'm sorry verse 35 he says do you not say there are yet four months then comes the harvest Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. Emphasis on the word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said. You said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. After the two days, he departed for Galilee. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. All right, so there's kind of the conclusion. So happy ending for the Samaritans? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is just about the smoothest ministry that Jesus ever has in his life. But what's sad is it's with essentially a Gentile nation. You see that? I mean, it was only in his hometown that he received the opposition, the arguments, the try to the gotchas. And there were other Samaritan towns that didn't accept Jesus. Don't get me wrong. But this one that's recorded is they're very open hearted and they didn't get a miracle, did they? The Samaritan people, they didn't get a sign. That's not one of the signs that John records. It says that they believed because of his word. 
And at first, the woman is the one testifying, and they're like, we just believe because of the testimony that we received, but now we believe because we've heard the real deal. Which, again, read chapter 1, and you'll start to see a lot of connections within that. Because you think about how the Jews received John the Baptist, which was pretty mixed, right? I mean, the people and even some of the Pharisees followed John the Baptist, and others just made them uncomfortable, or they disagreed, or they tried to catch him on stuff, you know, that kind of thing. But they received the Samaritan woman who bore testimony, and they believed. You see, so it's kind of very, uh, they got a lot more done as far as belief goes with less tools because they didn't have the full law. They didn't even have the full revelation. They didn't have John the Baptist. They just believed because the Samaritan woman, and then they finally met him. So you see, they were very inclined. Their hearts were very inclined to to Yahweh, which is um, awesome and totally opposite of what you'd expect if you're a Jewish reader, right? You're reading this, and you're like, yeah, the Pharisee's going to be totally receptive. He's the religious leader. He's the one that teaches, right? He's going to accept the servant of God. Nope. Who does? The Samaritan woman, the person that we thought, you know, is oh, unholy. You know, distance yourself from, from uh, Samaritan women. Um, let me look here because I wanted... Uh, yes. So, kind of concluding that thought with, with the woman at the well. I remember, I wanted you to think of Nicodemus and the woman at the well as kind of two... Um, similar narratives that are showing a broader picture. So Nicodemus, remember in, if you look back in chapter 3, verse 11, this is how Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. In verse 11, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Now that you in the Greek is plural. He's saying you all. So he's addressing the Jewish audience or the Jewish leaders that you all aren't grasping this essential concept. And then if you look at chapter 4 and verse 22, when Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan woman, he says, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. So that you, guess what the Greek is? Guess if it's singular or plural? Plural. Yep. (laughs) It's the plural word saying you all. And who's he addressing there? The Samaritans. So you kind of have the two audiences of the Jewish leaders and the Jewish mindset and then the Samaritans and the Samaritan people. And what is Jesus' critique of both? They're both wrong because that's the whole conversation can be wrapped up in Mount Gerizim representing the Samaritans or Jerusalem, the train, you know, the train of thought and of the Jews, which was all about bloodline and these additional things that they added onto the law. And Jesus is saying, it's neither, right? The hour is coming when it's going to be neither of these things. And he says that you have to worship in spirit and truth. Well, guess what? Jesus is God and spirit. And he says that he is the way, the truth, the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. You see, so all these things are wrapping up. When Jesus says that you have to worship in spirit and truth, he's saying it's not a physical location. It's not a physical bloodline. It's a spiritual family that God is making through me and through my sacrifice and the hour of my glorification at the time that I am crucified and resurrected, that I'm bringing all people to my arms, bringing all people to the Father. And so it's it's a beautiful, like, it's not, because I've always just kind of read that, like, spirit and truth, Mount Gerizim, you know, or Jerusalem, just kind of read through the text. But what you see is John's painting this beautiful portrait of going back to chapter one of this spiritual family, not designed by the will of man, by the will of flesh, totally by God's design, this spirit family. Um, which if you have a new, if you're born again, like Jesus tells Nicodemus, to be born again, Jesus is kind of saying that you have a new identity, right? That if you're born again, it's this renewed sense of who you are. You're no longer just about if, how closely you're related to Abraham or how closely you're related to David. It's about how close you are to the Father through the Son. And so this, it's this total upheaval of this previous mindset of who will be saved and who's righteous and who is Yahweh's true worshiper? And the answer is anyone can be <laughs> by belief, by belief in the Son, by the, through the sacrifice of the Son. Any questions on that before we look at the last part of chapter 4? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So when the Samaritans believed, what, what, did that, what did that entail? Were they just believing with their mind? Did they do something unto repentance? For who? The Samaritans? Um, I don't know. The text doesn't reveal. I'd assume there'd be something, because we know not everything's recorded, but I'm sure 
we have evidence that Jesus was baptizing, so perhaps they listened and they were baptized. I don't know. I don't want to add to or anything. Are allowed to be baptized under John's baptism at this time? That's a really good question. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'd say maybe, but then again, John the Baptist's testimony was centered in Jerusalem, so I don't think he ventured out too far into Samaria. Um, at least that's recorded, unless I'm wrong. Does anyone know? I, don't, I can't think of a time when, do you know? Was John the Baptist ever outside of Jerusalem or in Samaria? Well, yeah. well, I know, well, I can remember my studies. He was, he was just confined to yeah. Samaria. But now the Samaritans, they were waiting for the Messiah to come. Yeah. Because when Jesus introduced himself to uh, this Samaritan yep. woman, and she made the fact known that we're waiting for the, uh, the Messiah to come. Yeah. Right, how he's going to teach us. Yep. But now they had the the first five books of the Old Testament. Right. They knew that the Messiah was coming, but yep. the, the, the later books after the five books of Moses, they didn't. Right. Uh, yeah. I, I agree. I, I think so. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'd say they probably had something. I, I figured. They couldn't have had a better teacher than Jesus, so whatever they needed to do, Jesus taught them and they believed. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yep, yep. Well, as I know, the, the, John the Baptist preached only to the Jews. Yeah. As far as I know. Yeah, same, same here. That's, uh, that's all I could think of. So, uh, Which makes it more powerful if they didn't, because John the Baptist's whole mission was to prepare the people for the Messiah's uh, coming, you know, for him arriving. And so to think that the Samaritans didn't even have that background, they just had the first five books, which does mention the, the, this future prophet or Messiah that was going to teach the people. But you think about how much we know about the Messiah or Christ from the prophets, right? I mean, we have so many, that's where we get a lot of our info and like the Psalms and everything about prophecy about Jesus. They didn't even have that, right? They had very stripped down knowledge of the Messiah or very limited, I'll say that, very limited. And they believed, I mean, that quick with way less preparation, with way less resources, which is... Um, in contrast to how the Jews respond. Uh, let's see here. All right, so verse 46, it says, So we came again to Cana in Galilee. Remember, where, where have we seen Cana before? The wedding. Yep, the wedding, chapter 2. That start, kicked off this segment. Uh, in Galilee, where he had made the water uh, wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed, and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. All right, does anyone notice kind of paralleled thoughts here with this segment, with how the Jews respond to Jesus and with how the Samaritans just responded to Jesus? Yep. And it's like the Samaritans just a lot more faith go forward. Right. They, you nailed it. That, that's exactly it. Because verse 41, again, it says that the Samaritans believed because of the word, not because of a sign, not because of a miracle. Whereas the Jews, Jesus says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And then so you get the idea. And then you kind of have that funny dialogue with that man in his own heart. He asks his servants, you know, well, what time was he healed? Why do you, why do you suppose he asked that? Yep. From where, where he was at here. Right. And, and so Jesus healed by remote. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't have to go there and lay his hand on Right. Him. He didn't have to go there and see that person. Yeah. I mean, he could no doubt see it, and he, although it was 20 miles away. Right. And he said, your son lives up there. Yep. You know? And he, that, that chap, he just turned and, and left. So yeah. It was the next day that he arrived home, so I guess my horse back. 
Balaam, he's getting back, but he inquired about his son. Right. And he said, your son, is, the fever has left. And he yeah. said, this happened. And he, he knew then that it was, that Jesus was who he said he was. Yeah. It seems like there's two degrees of the of belief. So at first, there's kind of like a... a Jesus, you follow me, kind of a thing. Like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll lead Jesus where to go, kind of a deal. And, you know, and then you heal him, and then it'll be okay. Well, Jesus says go, and then, so he, he obeys, um, and it says he believes, but we know that just because a human believes doesn't mean it's a lasting belief. Because remember that kind of narration that it says that they believed in Jesus, but Jesus had no faith in them because he knew what was in a man because it's duplicitous and then we stop believing whenever things don't go our way and so there's he initially kind of believes but it seems like what seals the deal is when he finally learns what hour he was healed because it says then you know he no knew then, right? do what it wasn't a right yes yeah that's what I, I, I think that's, I think that's, it, I, I don't want to assume anything, but I kind of caught on to that too. Like, it kind of feels like that. Like, yeah. there's this initial belief, but he wanted to make sure kind of a deal. You know, he was like, wait, what hour did this happen? Because he wanted to be for sure that this is, that I can, you know, tack this on to Jesus. That, you know, that I can give Jesus credit for this, which is. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. Um, how can he speak? And he, so evidently when he got there, it, it was like, ah, yeah. You know, this must be the son of God. This must be. And yep. He's like, uh, probably should have picked him up. Right, yeah. Yeah. So his ability to do these things transcend, transcends our mind and our perception of how things work. Yes. Right. The spirit. I mean, that's what he says, right? You can see the effects, but you can't see the wind. <laughs> right. Yep. Um, I really like this, uh, this commentator, Barrett. He wrote this in his commentary that the creative will of God realized with obedience sustains life. I, I really like that. that. The creative will of God with, the sustain, uh, with obedience sustains life. And I like the creative, too, because, I mean, who would think to use these illustrations like living water or use death to bring life right that's that's pretty creative i'd say so yes sir so i don't know i had never thought about the man not having not fully believed and i don't know that he didn't because right if you read the account he's he's on his way home and his mm -hmm. servants meet him mm -hmm. and say hey he's your cousin so i don't know that he i mean there, there's no there's no Information as to this guy's like, man. I sure hope he's. I sure hope he's alive. I sure hope he's, he comes through. Yeah. It's. I think it's just that confirmation of that miracle, because the servants meet him on the road, and he, he just. Well, when did this? That's great. When did right. This happen? I don't right. know. I just think that's very good. Yeah. Yeah. I. I I, I guess the only way I'd be thinking, I'm not saying I'm not saying he didn't believe. No. Yeah. 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 I don't. I, I, he had some. He had belief, it records that. I guess, and that may be reading into it to say that he asked that for that reason. We don't know that. I guess I was thinking of kind of the difference between when the disciples, as we're going to see later on, when Jesus talks about eating his body and, and drinking his blood, that many who had believed were like, oh. and then I, So it wasn't like a, a firm foundation of, of faith, I guess is what I'm saying. So uh, I think it could be read that way, that there was a initial belief, but maybe not a sound one, because there is, does seem to be a contrast with the second mention, because it says, and his whole household. Like, it seems like there was a more of like a, uh, after that moment, he for sure, it was solidified, maybe. But I, that may be reading into it. I don't know. I don't know. Um, as long as we'll all go to heaven, if we, <laughs> yeah, I, I think we'll be okay. <laughs> uh, Right, so again, 
John, I have John 17, 4 here written, so let's find out why I have that written. Oh, yeah, speaking about the work. When Jesus says that doing the work of God or the, the food is the work or the will of God, John 17, 4 gives us uh, a specific work that Jesus is talking, talking about. In Jesus' prayer, he says, I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And what's about to, fall, what's about to happen after this conversation that Jesus has with God and his disciples? His, yes, he's going to be put to death, betrayed, and that whole process. So the work of God in this case, or the commands for God for his son, weren't really happy, awesome commands for Jesus, Right? I mean, the work of God for him was suffering. It was death, but it was to redeem this spiritual family. All right, uh, how much time do we have left? We got 12 minutes. I think we can do this. All right, we're going to look at chapter 5, but we're not going to delve too deeply into the text yet, except for one part. Um, Can someone read John 5, 1 through 4? Does anyone have verse 4 in their Bible? Of John 5. Does anyone have verse 4? No one has it? Yes. Do you have it? Oh, awesome. Sometimes an angel of the Lord came down from the pool and stirred it up, stirred up the water. After the angel did this, the first person to go into the pool was healed from any sickness that he had. All right. Okay, and raise your hand if verse 4 is not in your Bible. Okay, pretty big portion, right? All right, so the question is, who took John 5, 4 out of my Bible? <laughs> I, I thought we could take a quick aside tonight because I figured we wouldn't have too much time to get into the, to the text, but this is Bible class, and so I thought it'd be cool to practice something because this is, we're going to learn about uh, exegesis, exegesis and eisegesis. So has anyone heard that term before? They're kind of funny words, like ex of what? <laughs> I say who? No, no, that's still chapter four. Yeah, we're not going to, I'll have the five for Sunday, but uh, we'll just look at this with the limited time we have left. All right, so if you don't know what exegesis or eisegesis means, I'm going to give you an, an illustration, all right, an example for you, so it'll be easy to understand. So let's say that you're at the McDonald's in Mount Sterling, all right? So you walk in, you go inside to order, and then they have those tables there behind where you order. So you're sitting there, and imagine you hear from the table behind you, you just hear two people talking together, and one friend says, ah, I'm going to kill him. All right, pause. So hear those words, I'm going to kill him. What do you do? Well, yeah, yeah, you, you, you probably do nothing. You probably wait, because there's a lot of different options of what's going on there in that conversation, right? So you might think, um, am I listening to a plot to a murder? right now? Am I going to be an accessory to crime? (laughs) Can I get charged for this? You might wonder, uh, is she a murder mystery writer? And she's talking about the plot or the end of her new book. And she says, you know, I'm going to kill him at the end. I'm going to kill off the main character. Um, Maybe she's being hyperbolic, right? Maybe she's really angry at someone. She just says, oh, I'm going to kill him. Maybe her husband left the toilet seat up. You know, there's a whole different options of, of what's going on there. And so you don't immediately spring into action, right? I mean, because what you could maybe assume, it may not be that reasonable, but what you could assume with your back to them is they're talking about me. They're going to kill me. And so it would be insane if you then preemptively turned around and started attacking them, right? You said you, said you were going to kill me, right? Because that'd be an assumption. You didn't have a basis to act on that. And so with exegesis and eisegesis, exegesis means to lead out of, which means you want to gather the meaning from what's already there and you want to know what the original intention was. And I see Jesus is you read into it, to lead into. So I take what I think and I put it into that thing, which would be like calling the police, right? As soon as you hear, I'm going to kill him, it'd be insane for you to call 911 and say, I'm at the McDonald's and someone's planning to kill somebody, right? No one would do that because it's not reasonable, it's not logical. And so we have to use those same principles when we read scripture because we're going to come across some things and they're nothing new. Because I don't know if you knew this, but by, when, ta- when Paul was writing letters, there were a lot of fake apostles that started forging his letters, that would teach these different things, claiming they were super apostles. And so Paul had to remind the churches to constantly, like, read through these things, all right? Look at the scripture, look at these teachings. And he tells Timothy in uh, 2 Timothy 2, 
uh, to rightly handle the word of truth. And I like that word because the Greek word means cut, like make a straight cut, you know, kind of like a surgeon. So you, sometimes you have to kind of look real close and make sure you make a precise cut. So what does that have to do with verse four? <laughs> well, here's what we're going to get to. So we're going to practice those principles of being you know, reasonable, logical, looking at resources, and seeing what we can lead out of the text in, in John 5. So just some historical background, background to this. In 24 manuscripts, textual experts found asterisks surrounding verse four to indicate, which you know how we have asterisks, they had those two certain symbols, but it was made as a warning to other scribes to let them know that whatever this is was added later. So in 24 manuscripts, verse 4 is surrounded in asterisks for the scribes to let them know, hey, this was added. And then somewhere along the line, it just got accepted and then uh, perpetuated. But the earliest and most accurate manuscripts that we have of the Gospel of John, nowhere near mentioned verse 4. Verse 4 isn't in there. So in the original text, it wasn't there. Um, and in the ones that did have it, there were asterisks to let them know that it was added. Uh, and just finally, as just so you know, four out of five words in the verse, okay, that's four out of five, are never used by John in the rest of the gospel that he writes. So kind of unfamiliar language to John. Uh, the context, and this is what we want to look at, because if you remember what's going on here in chapter five, there's a paralytic man, right? And he's waiting by a pool because the idea was that once they get in the pool, when it moves at a certain time of day, they would be healed. And Jesus then heals the man. No pool involved. <laughs> Jesus just tells him, rise up and walk, and he, he, he's healed. So verse 4 is not omitted, and I want to stress this. It is not omitted because angels are in it. Right? That's not a crazy thing because the Bible is filled with angels. Right, The Bible has no problem with angels. So that's not why verse 4 is omitted in a lot of translations. But if you think about the context of what's going on here in these first few verses is Jesus as the true healer, right? I mean, the emphasis is on Jesus. And the point is that whatever this man had been trying to get healed by all of these years hadn't worked. So some questions we can look at is, or, or some things that we can think about is all things through Jesus. So with Nicodemus, right, it wasn't bloodline. It wasn't about your Judaism. It was about your connection to God and being born of the water and spirit. With the Samaritan woman, it wasn't this physical water, and it wasn't Mount Gerizim. The answer was Jesus. With the paralytic, it wasn't a pool. It wasn't an angel. It was Jesus who brought the fulfillment of God's will. And so with that emphasis, you start to see it make more sense because what's most likely going on is that this was a Jewish superstition because guess what? The Jews had a lot of those. <laughs> they had a lot of weird things that they would say or, per, uh, you know, uh, well, I guess Paul talks about it with, uh, with Timothy and Titus that they would devote themselves to, or he says not to devote yourselves to silly myths because guess what? There were a lot of silly myths going along. And there's a lot of kind of these old wives tales that were going on about, you know, angels and demons, and all these things. And Paul tells Timothy, you know, don't, don't have, don't take part in that, right? Just focus on the scripture. And so it's, it's not that there's a problem with angels or anything like that, but even in the context, if you look in verse 3, it says, and these lay a multitude of invalids, blame, lime, lame, and paralyzed. If that pool worked, why was there a multitude of sick people around it all the time? You see what I'm saying? It seems like it didn't, uh, and some people may say verse 7 is a contradiction because I've seen that. Like, no, it should be there because verse 7 confirms verse 4. But let's look at verse 7. It says, the sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. Now, is anywhere in that expressly stated that the person who stepped in was healed or that they were even sick to begin with? It doesn't even say that. <laughs> so, you know, th those things aren't in contradiction. Who troubled the water? Who troubled? Right, the later manuscripts do include it. The, so it doesn't, it doesn't do any injustice to verse 4 does it to say that the angels did that, does it? It doesn't do it any injustice, certainly, and I, I don't have a problem either way. I mean, at the end of the day, if it is in there, it doesn't doctrinally change anything. The point is still on Jesus being the healer. Um, whereas verse 7, I've seen some commentaries that talk about the water being stirred up because they talk about the location. 
and that there was a natural spring that would move at certain times of day and would move the water. So it was either the Jews built this superstition based on that natural occurrence, or it maybe it could be an angel was there, but the con- with the timing of the manuscripts, because a lot of the later manuscripts that do include verse 4 kind of have some other errors that aren't even in the rest of, of John, um, whereas the earliest ones, the most accurate ones, don't have it. So I'd be more inclined to go with that just exegetically, but... You know, at the end of the day, if it's wrong, I don't think it's going to cause any problems as long as the emphasis is on Jesus being the true healer. And whatever this was hadn't healed these folks that were waiting there and hadn't healed him. And he's devoted his life and served, you know, it says 38 years, right? That's a long time of not receiving this healing. And he seems like he's been desperately trying to do this thing that isn't healing, that isn't fulfilling him, whereas Jesus offers it immediately. Because then you could ask the question, why doesn't Jesus lead him into the pool as well you know if it was just as simple as you know pushing him in there at that time jesus could say wait and then move him in the water but i don't know so you're saying they, they didn't get healed by this pool of water uh it doesn't say that uh verse four i thought it was the first man in at the time and that was it once a day you know what i've, I've read this wrong or something because I, I thought somebody was healed every day there. well verse four says that they were healed but that's the verse that's under question that that we're examining with the manuscripts like Verse 7, see, that's why I emphasize verse 7, because verse 7 doesn't say that the, pers- that the people who went in there were sick or that they were healed. It just says, someone steps into the water before me. But there's not any context to given as to what, um, especially with verse 4 being not in the earliest manuscripts. So if you read that, we kind of read it with verse 4 still in our minds because we're familiar with it. But if you erase verse 4 kind of from your vocabulary and you read the text, it doesn't necessitate that the people who stepped in were sick. Right. Not every day, but you know, it was, so they were all sitting there waiting, and you know, the wind could have blown and stirred the water. Right. The right. There, so that, well, there were a lot of Jewish superstitions. Yeah. The superstition, and that's why they were all there waiting. Jesus comes along, and he says, "You know, what are you doing?" And he said, "Well, I can't be the first one to get in there because of this." And Jesus says, "Get up, right? Take your mat, and, go, and the man is healed." Yeah. So I, I, I feel like it's just a superstition, and that's why it's been left out. But then you go back uh, in these later manuscripts, and it explains why they would have all been there so that people would know. So I right. Think that, I don't think that there was any. I don't. I, I don't know that there's any proof in this scripture that says that there was any healing. They. It was something they believed, and it said from time to time, it was believed. I believe. I think is what they're saying. Yeah. That, that would happen. So yeah, I, I tend to take that road, but again, it's not this. It doesn't create a, a, a doctrinal, you know, uh, disharmony. You know, it, it doesn't cause anything that that's that contradicts each other either way, it's because we know angels. Why Jesus asked him why he was there. <laughs> well, yeah, he says, "Do you want to be healed?" Really <laughs> right. I think that's the main takeaway, and I I want that to be the main point of regardless of whether it was the angel who truly did that, which I have no problem believing. I mean, angels have done crazier things in the scripture, um, and even if it wasn't, the point remains the same: that this man couldn't receive the healing that he needed except through Jesus. That Jesus was the better alternative to whatever anything else could offer. Just like with Nicodemus, just like with the woman at the well, and just right here with this paralytic man. Whatever they had to offer didn't do what it needed to do until Christ. What about all the others that were there and they saw this happen? Yeah. Yeah. Wait a minute. (laughs) He cut. Oh, very good. Well, uh, if you have any more questions about that or you'd like to talk about that more, uh, we, I absolutely love to do that. I, uh, if you want to share materials, I'm more than open to it. I, I love to learn. <laughs> I really do. Um, any questions or comments before we end tonight? All right. Brother Stan, would you lead us in closing prayer? Father, for the brethren that are here, and that uh, you open our hearts and minds to your word, that we can grow, we can be better servants for you. And we pray, Father, as we leave this place, that you would watch out for us, keep us safe, 
And we pray, Father, that you would be with this congregation and help us to continue to grow in your knowledge and your spirit. And we pray, Father, that you, uh, we thank you for the unity that's here. And pray that you would continue to help us to work to, to strengthen that unity. And we ask, Father, that you would um, bless us as we uh, go out into this community and that we can share your gospel uh, on, with others. Father, be with us. Help us always, Father, to put our trust in you. These things we ask in your son's name. Amen. 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 No. No. Which always makes it trickier when you're trying to study something like that.